Well, thank you. And Phil, that was a phenomenal presentation. I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about the Center of Excellence for Barty Beetle Syndrome, what we're, do what we're doing here in the States. Um, as many of you know, I reside in Wisconsin, which is with, um, realizing that uh, you may not know the geography of the United States very well, but this in the upper mid, uh, Midwest, um, we are uh, right next to Canada, but divided by uh, the Lake Superior, which is a huge lake that separates the two countries. But nonetheless, it's just an absolute pleasure to speak with you. As Tony said, um, last year I planned to come to um, visit London and speak, and my wife and I um, were very, very excited about coming. My wife has been to, to um, England several times and absolutely loves it. We had invited our two granddaughters, shown on the, in the picture on the right, um, to join us. Um, they were absolutely excited. And um, with great disappointment, we had to call our granddaughters who live in Alaska, um, which is um, uh, quite um, a cold place to live. But they were very, very excited to join us um, and come to, to um, England, but weren't able to. Um, we look forward to that opportunity in the future, very much so. My roots, um, I enjoy genealogy. Genealogy is one of my favorite hobbies. Um, and my um, ancestral roots go back to the UK. So actually, many of my um, ancestors um, came on uh, in the um, 17th, 18th, and uh, 19th century to the United States, and they, they came from England, Ireland, and Scotland. This is my last ancestor who came. Um, her name was Susanna Bailey Jarrett, and Susanna uh, immigrated at uh, 18 years of age. Um, um, in the mid 1880s to the United States. Um, I picture this church where she, uh, from the town that she grew up in uh, that might have been where she worshiped. And so, so I deeply, deeply respect and appreciate the, the English um, heritage that I share with you. Um, and she has made a huge difference in my life as well as my other ancestors. So moving forward, I um, uh, use my genealogy um, interest. I went back and looked at the different cities or towns or maybe villages that my ancestors came from. Perhaps some of you recognize these locations, perhaps maybe some even live there. I, I have to admit my knowledge of the geography of, of uh, the UK is, is not very good. Well, people have asked me over the years, how did I get interested in Barty Beetle Syndrome? What has driven my interest in, and um, helped me to want to make a difference? This little girl, her name is Ashley, and Ashley is a little bit less than a year of age in this picture. Um, Ashley um, has been um, a patient that I've taken care of. She's now 28 years of age. Um, she's taught me a lot, along with a number of other individuals who are interested in BBS um, who, or who have BBS. And so with Ashley, I actually met her before she was born. And this picture I'm showing right now is a picture of a kidney. For those who are, are um, visually impaired, the kidney is, um, is shown here and it has a bright appearance. This is not how a kidney should look. This kidney has what we call a salt and pepper appearance. Um, and the, the pepper is from little cyst within the kidney um, that um, uh, clearly warn uh, a um, perinatologist or a nephrologist that there's a problem going on. And as a young physician, shortly out of my training in fellow, as a fellow in pediatric nephrology, I was certain that I knew exactly what this child's problem was. And I told the parent that the child had autosomal recessive polycystic disease. Maybe some of you have, have also been told that you might have autosomal recessive polycystic disease before a more correct diagnosis of BBS was made. At any rate, the child was born nearly at term. Her kidney function was very, very poor. Um, but there are other things that were different about her. In this picture of her uh, hand, there's a picture of a hand x-ray that I'm demonstrating. And for those who are not, who are visually impaired, the bones are fused in a funny way. They're, they're not normal. You can also see um, those who are visually capable can see that the fingers are a bit uh, abnormal in appearance. And that was Ashley's hand as well. Um, that um, immediately began as this, question as to what was wrong with this child because she, because she didn't fall in the typical pattern of autosomal recessive polycystic disease. She also, um, unlike autosomal recessive polycystic disease, didn't have very severe blood pressure, which is usually a, a mark, a hallmark of ARPKD. Um, and although I had to start her on dialysis as an infant, 
her kidney function kind of got better. She used to make a lot of urine and it became um, just so much different than what I expected with polycystic kidney disease. But one of the striking features is shown in this picture. And so again, for those who um, have some visual impairment, there's a picture of four little children. All of those children have kidney failure. They were all my patients at the same time that Ashley was there. Um, Ashley's in the, de the blue denim outfit. If you look closely, you'll see a striking difference. Ashley is quite chubby. She loved to eat. Now, most patients that have kidney failure, especially infants that have kidney failure, don't eat. They, it's, it's a struggle. So there's a little girl on her Ashley's right side in a white dress with a red ribbon, and she's got a little tape across her face, and that tape is holding a tube from her nose into her stomach called a nasogastric tube that we would use to feed her every single day um, because she would refuse to eat otherwise. Um, also, um, there's a little girl with a yellow flower on. She also had kidney failure and uh, she doesn't have a tube and you can't see it right now, but she would have a tube placed in at nighttime and would feed her um, during the nighttime um, while she was on dialysis. Well, this combination of a funny hand, a child that just loved to eat, a child that urinated a whole lot and very different, different appearance from polycystic kidney disease ultimately started to search for what is the right diagnosis. And this was back in 1993, as before um, the, the absolute landmark um, uh, paper by, by Professor Bills on criteria for BBS. That paper was absolutely instrumental for helping so many of us as, as clinicians to make a diagnosis of BBS in people. What we struggled and ultimately found the diagnosis of uh, uh, Barty Beetle syndrome in this child. And that was very, very helpful. Also a landmark finding was that there's these cilia that Professor Bills has so well shown. He used a cartoon diagram to uh, um, explain the cilia. I'm gonna use as a kidney doctor, a picture of a tube. In the kidney, we have filters we call glomeruli. They're attached to tubes we call tubules and the urine flows through those tubules and ultimately will um, drain into our bladder. Um, in the tubules are these little hair-like structures and those again that aren't visually impaired, there's a little string-like thing that comes off the surface of the cell, we call a cilia. And in the kidney, those cilia seem to be a monitor for the flow of urine through them. And they respond to various hormonal actions to control the amount of urine output we make. That was, that's changed in Barty Beetle syndrome. And that's why Ashley made so much urine is that regulatory mechanism was disrupted. And that was extremely helpful as we began to try to understand. And, and as Dr. As Professor Bills pointed out, the um, increase in knowledge that has come about Barty Beetle syndrome in the last 25 years is absolutely amazing and delightful. Well, um, those that stumbling finding to the diagnosis of Barty Beetle syndrome was wonderful because the mother of this of this child became very, very influential in my career. Um, she was the um, uh, parent of the, that organized the BBS Family Association and encouraged me along to come to conferences such as this one. And I had the opportunity to hear people's questions. And those questions um, and comments that I heard from parents included these. One was, healthcare providers just don't know about BBS and how can we make a difference? I go to my doctor's office, we go for a checkup in the United States, um, we have an insurance-based healthcare system, and so um, they uh, a private insurance-based system, and they would go to a, one doctor, which would be an endocrinologist, and, and they'd say, my child's got BBS, and the doctor would say, excuse me for a minute, and he or she would go into their office, pull out their textbook, and read for a few minutes about BBS, and then come back in and start to talk about the disease. And it was frustrating to the parents because the parents would usually know more about Barty Beetle syndrome than their providers. Another complaint that I heard frequently was how fragmented healthcare was and that uh, providers didn't work together. Um, so again, in the United States model of healthcare, um, you might go to one provider who's an endocrinologist who wouldn't speak to their nephrologist, who wouldn't speak to the ophthalmologist, and ultimately no one was working together. And that really frustrated the healthcare system for parents. They just felt like it could be better. One of the other things that, that that again, what the uh, BBS UK is making possible is the chance for networking, for meeting each other. And these individuals I met with often said, I just would like to meet someone else who has Barty Beetle syndrome. It means so much to me. If I could just ask them questions and learn from them. 
and they had this great desire to network. Also, what I heard from, from the leaders of the BBS Foundation and, and here in the United States and others is the need for a registry. And, and uh, Professor Bills gave a wonderful example of uh, the registry in the, in the UK. And I'll talk to you a little bit, little bit more about the clinical registry investigating Barty Beetle syndrome, uh, which he alluded to as well. Well, we started developing the Center of Excellence for BBS. We're a little bit behind what you've done um, in the UK. Ours is a different model, of course, with private insurance. But what we did is at the Marshall Clinic, it's a very large clinic in central Wisconsin, where we assembled specialists um, in all sorts of fields. And so we have individuals in cardiology, uh, pediatric and adult, um, neurology, neuropsychology, dermatology, medical genetics, uh, physical medicine, re rehabilitation, orthopedics, all working together. It's a wonderful group of people who have a common goal to provide the best care possible we can to our patients. We have therapists, um, physical therapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists that are part of it. Uh, integral to this is a dietitian who is just amazing as she works with the families on wise diet choices. Important to this is we have child life specialists and child life specialists, I assume you have the exact same thing, perhaps called something different in the UK, but these are individuals, usually women, who are just amazing working with our children with BBS because they're not always too excited about getting an ultrasound the day they come to the clinic or a blood draw for sure they're not very excited about. And these child life specialists really do amazing things. So what we do with this center is we see these patients, they come from all over the United States. They also come from overseas. So we have individuals from as far as away as Australia and Saudi Arabia, um, the territories of the United States and Canada who have come to receive care. And we don't want it just to be a one and done experience. So we, what we do is we provide the families with a very um, comprehensive binder carrying, covering all of their healthcare with us, as well as the healthcare that they, they received in the past. There's images of all their radiology supply um, images. And, and we send that both to the families as they carry it home with them, as well as to their uh, primary providers, that uh, we act to be a resource for them. We love when patients come back annually, but we recognize that um, that's not always possible. So we continue to have um, relationships with their providers. Uh, I call them on a regular basis to talk about the care of their patient. Um, and that helps the coordination of care so it's unified, which is really one thing that we wanted to do so, so well. One of the things I mentioned was networking. So what we do is during these um, uh, events, we have families, uh, we have lunches together, we have dinners together. Now COVID has really put a kibosh on that. But nonetheless, usually we have, uh, uh, before COVID we'd have dinners together and, and just sit and talk and enjoy each other. This is a, uh, our coordinator, um, Sonia Suda, who does so much to bring this all together. And so I have to give her credit for, for much of what's happened in our center. This is one of the dinners I mentioned, um, getting together. That has taught me so much to sit and eat with, with individuals with Barty Beetle syndrome, um, perhaps more than just the ability to hear their stories, is just the ability to um, uh, have a special relationship and a love for them. In this picture of, of there's eight individuals that have Barty Beetle syndrome. There's one person in the center, there's a short fat guy with a blue, sh blue um, shirt on, that's me. Um, but in this picture too, on my left, um, on, for those who look in the picture, it's probably on your right. There's a young man in, with a black um, t-shirt on with um, the band Kiss on it. Um, he has Barty Beetle syndrome. He's tall and thin, cognitively he has some challenges. He has some vision impairment. But interestingly, his sister who I assume has basically the same thing that caused her body Beetle syndrome is in the, gray, in the gray shirt. And she struggles with weight and appetite. Um, she, on the other hand, has no cognitive impairment. She's just graduated from college, doing very nicely. Um, in the picture are other individuals and, and the young lady on my right with the green shirt uh, is a young woman um, of African-American descent who has an absolutely beautiful voice. And I ask her to sing every time she comes to our dinner because she has this gorgeous voice that she shares with us. Well, that's just one thing that we try to do is to try to produce networking because it, science is wonderful and I'm a deep believer in science, but friendship is even more powerful. And so speaking about that, we had organized a Lions camp, Lions International, uh, which I assume is also very important in the UK. 
um, helped us develop a camp. Um, and this camp is, uh, is in Wisconsin, in my home, in my home area. Um, and at that camp, in this picture, there are 75 individuals with Barty Beetle syndrome or family members of, of, of individuals with Barty Beetle syndrome um, that came together for a week-long um, event where we just really enjoyed each other. And so in these pictures, I show some of the things. Again, for those who are visually impaired, there are individuals um, uh, with archery, I love one picture in the center because there's a father behind his daughter who's, who's in a wheelchair. You can kind of see he's backing up, is a little bit worried that she's got a bow and arrow in her hands, uh, but none of this, everything was safe. Um, we played goal ball together and volleyball together and had dances, and it was just a lot of fun. Um, in the center of the picture, you see this large pole going up and down. That's a totem pole. That's how the um, Native Americans have um, record their history and their ancestry. It's, it's very, very important. We have meals together and just have a great time. And so that's, that's been a wonderful aspect of the opportunity to get together. Now I showed this picture and this is a picture um, and a, a slide that talks about some of our support groups that have come because of this. And I, I bring this to your attention. Um, first I'll talk about those support groups, but now I, I wanna share with you something exciting that's happened in the last 24 hours for us. There's a BBS parent support group where they get together as parents and talk about challenges that they meet. They talk about where they can buy the best shoes that fit their child's feet. Um, they talk about how they're working with the schools. There's a young adult support group um, where young adults talk about college. Um, they talk about life as an independent individual or life at home, and it helps them to share experiences. There's a movie night, which was fairly recently created where they watch a movie together and talk about it a book club that's been going on for several years where they read a favorite book each month and, and discuss it. And it's a wonderful opportunity for individuals with Barty Beetle syndrome to do that. That's actually directed by um, an individual by the name of Ellen Hunter. And Ellen has Barty Beetle syndrome. She's a, a family and marriage counselor and it's just absolutely wonderful with that. The sports club is probably the most favorite club um, here in the, in the United States, um, American football. Um, is a passionate thing that the, that the people of BBS talk about. Uh, on the, the picture on the right is Luke. Luke um, was the one that predicted who would win the Super Bowl. Again, that might be um, compared to the World Cup. The Super Bowl is a big deal here. And um, he predicted who would win and he predicted this, the, he was the closest as far as score. And so um, the moderator for the group um, is an avid sports fan. And he sent him a picture, he sent him a, a helmet um, worn by a former player for the San Francisco Giant uh, 49ers, which is a, um, a football team here in the United States that's quite popular. There's a women's group, there's a Weight Watchers group, adult discussion group, and we're coming out with a cookbook very soon. Um, well, the, the exciting thing about this is up until this time, we've used a phone line that um, was only available to people in, in the States and in Canada. We, as of yesterday, are beginning to work on a WebEx opportunity, so it will be available across the world. So if you want to join any of these um, events, please, I will let you know about that as soon as all is all organized and ready to go, um, because it's a great opportunity to network with each other. Well, networking is wonderful, but I'd like to bring now to the concept of registries and why what, Dr., um, what Professor Bill spoke about as far as the, the UK registry, how important that is. And I, I just applaud that effort. I want to talk to you a little bit about the clinical registry investigating Barty Beetle syndrome. And I think it's okay to have different registries. I really do. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a few minutes. But the, the Cribs registry was really greatly benefited by a couple of people I have a picture of. The picture on my left um, is of Yaffa Rubenstein. Yaffa is a brilliant, brilliant scientist who saw the vision of making it possible for registries to be integrated together. We also use a REDCap database just as this is used by, Dr. by Professor Bills. And um, he often envisioned the ability to use something called I2B2 technology to be able to bring all the different registries into a common home as if you might think of books in a library where you could examine those different books to find things that might be common between different diseases. Perhaps we could also figure out how to repurpose drugs. So a drug that might work very well for, well, let's say a common disease such as hypertension may have phenomenal effects on 
um, albinal uh, uh, albinism, as it's been shown that L-DOPA does. And that drug repurposing could bring amazing research to the forefront. And, and Yaffa was um, a key to this. And so I, I met with Yaffa. We had long discussions about how the Cribs registry should be developed. And so Yaffa was paramount to that. Below a picture of Yaffa is um, a, pic a picture of Cliff Caston. Cliff lives about 250, May, no, about 250 miles from me to the west in Minnesota, which is the state adjacent to Wisconsin. Phil is a pediatric nephrologist um, at the University of Minnesota, where he developed a registry um, for Alport syndrome. Now, Alport syndrome is totally unrelated to, to Barty Beetle syndrome, but it's a, it's a kidney disease um, associated with uh, loss of kidney function, loss of vision, and, and impaired hearing. And Phil developed a phenomenal registry, and he invited me to spend time with him. So I went and spent some time at the University of Minnesota learning more about how his registry was created and how to make it effective. And with that, we developed the Clinical Registry Investigating Barty Beetle Syndrome. On the slide, there is a link to the, the web page for this, and it gives a great deal of information. So I want to explain to you why I think this is, is why registries, I think, have a huge impact on improving the care for Barty Beetle Syndrome. This is the statement from a paper um, um, from um, Japan, and I'll read it to you. In summary, our study provides evidence that the genetic background patients with BBS in Japan um, in, are at least partly consistent with those of patients with BBS in other countries. Our results might facilitate the enrollment of Japanese patients in international activities, such as clinical registry investigating Barty Beetle syndrome in the United States. Krebs gathers comprehensive health information from patients in the ROS and puts in a repository, which can be excuse me, used to comprehend the complex features and serve as a platform for researchers to develop effective treatments. I appreciate that comment because I really do believe that registries have such an ability to facilitate understanding of, of BBS. For me, I was very, very passionate as the first question I wanted to answer with Cribs was whether kidney transplants could be effectively used in Barry Beetle syndrome um, or effectively used. I say that because um, uh, at least in the United States, and I'm sure it's true in the UK and other countries, that if, a if an individual has a certain body mass index, they're not allowed to have a kidney transplant. Well, small series and case reports suggest the kidney transplant might be okay, but I have to tell you that transplant surgeons are very uh, attentive to their outcomes and they did not want to move forward with transplanting kids who had severe obesity or other issues that might prohibit them from having a successful transplant. And so sadly, I would hear from patients of mine that, uh, or from individuals within the States at least, that they'd gone to the transplant center seeking a, that opportunity and were denied the opportunity for a kidney transplant and left to, to remain on, on dialysis the rest of their lives, which will often be impaired. There's questions that about the transplant, not only was it gonna be successful, but are they an increased risk of cancer, which is a known complication associated with immunosuppressive therapy? Were they a risk of diabetes? And would that diabetes affect the transplant health? Do they have a higher rate of kidney rejection? And so these are questions that were being asked and no one can answer them. Based on those case reports, one could simply not feel comfortable whether you could do a transplant or not. I'm gonna show a diagram. And, and again, for those who are visually impaired, this is a little bit limited for that and, and for you, and I apologize for that, but I didn't know how to better show this. This is from a publication that came from Cribs. And in the lower panel, on, in panel B, we compared our outcomes of individuals with BBS who had kidney transplants from across the United States and across the world, actually. Um, we had looked at 21 individuals who had, had a kidney transplant. Now, kidney transplant medicine is, has changed over the years. And so what was available back in the 1980s, uh, what was not available in the 1980s is now available. So you can't really compare a transplant in the 1980s to a transplant in 2021. But we looked at other studies that were which were temporarily conducted at the same time as, as, as our um, retrospective review using CRIBS. What we found is if you look at the bottom, this is the survival, 100% survival here, 80% survival here. And we looked at survival in our patients at 20 years and you see the patients that we had a very good survival rate. Matter of fact, it was actually better than the other studies in black 
from other from other in, um, other disease causes. Now, statistically, it was the same, but the point was they did well. When you looked at the survival of the kidney, again, this anything to your towards your left is better survival. At 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 25 years, 50% of the kidneys were working in people with Barty Beetle syndrome, compared to at 20 years in other studies, only about 22% were working as uh, were still functioning graphs. So that would give us a lot of ability to use that registry to say to transplant surgeons, it's a go, the transplantation is, is possible. Now, weight is still an issue, and I'll talk about weight in just a few minutes. Um, and so with that, that was the largest series um, yet published <clears throat> about kidney transplant outcomes, and it came from Cribs. And I just wanna express my appreciation to those in the, that listening to this conference today who shared your information with me so that we could publish that. Because to me, as a kidney doctor, that was extremely, extremely important. And so can CRISP be used for other information that might affect transplantation? That was an important question to me. Again, I'm focusing on the kidney right now because that's my world. Um, you know, one of the things that we observed in the registry was this thing called cytosine versus and heterotaxy. And we published a paper that I'd like to talk about some of the pictures. And so in this picture, I show images of individuals with either cytosine versus or heterotaxy. What that means is the organs in the chest and abdomen are in the wrong location or pointed the wrong direction. So in the middle, in this picture that's labeled panel A, there's a heart, and this is the heart. But unlike where the heart's supposed to be, this panel over here shows where the heart's supposed to be. This heart's in the middle of the body. The stomach is on the wrong side of the body. The liver crosses across both the left and the right side, and there's Individuals had, had um, you can see with the heart's pointing the wrong direction in this picture person, that's situs inversus. Um, and in this person here is it's got heterotaxy because um, the heart's pointing the right direction, but the abdominal organs are all in the wrong spot. Why is that important to a transplant surgeon? Well, in that situation, the blood that returns to the lower extremities goes up something called the inferior vena cava. That large blood vessel in people with heterotaxy is disrupted. And so they have some of this um, where they basically don't have a normal return of blood to their heart. It happens, but it's done through different vessels called the azagus and hemiazagus veins. Well, that is a big deal. So when you're doing a transplant, if you do not know that, and you, you prepare to put the kidney into someone and they have that abnormal vessels, you're gonna be stuck. Tragically, this became important to me because one of our patients that came to clinic told me the story of her sister who had features of Barty Beetle syndrome, who went to surgery for an abdominal cause. And unfortunately the surgeon didn't recognize the issue of heterotaxy in, her, in this young lady. And she had severe complications, ultimately died two days after the surgery. Meaning to me, there's the importance of pointing out to people something that we could only find with cribs because this rare phenomenon it only occurs in about 1.6% of our patients in cribs, but it occurs 700 times more commonly in, it should be 170 more times commonly in BBS than in other individuals. Really important to me. So from cribs, we have been able to share other information um, about dental care. We, we were able to retrospectively look through cribs at dental issues. Um, we looked at weight patterns and the genetics behind it. As Dr. As Professor Beals alluded to, genetics plays a major role there. We looked at sleep and activity patterns. That's in, in press. We looked at seizures. We looked at skin manifestations. We looked at kidney transplantation, as I mentioned, and cytosine inversus. Right now, we're looking at genetics. I want to talk, take a minute to also express my appreciation to you in the UK. The um, question always comes up, is one form of, uh, of one gene type of BBS more prone to, towards kidney failure than another? Well, how does genetics play into that? And so using the database, and we have, again, about 650 people in cribs, um, we've looked back at the people that have had kidney transplant. We found that about, about seven to 8%, so between seven and 8% of individuals with BBS go on to kidney, need a kidney transplant. We found genes that, caught, that seem to be much more likely to be associated with, with um, kidney failure than others. And that's important. There's one gene that strikes me as very, very important. And that's a gene that I call, that Dr. Uh, uh, the Professor Beals alluded to, it's called SDCCAG8, or also known as BBS16. 
Now, in the Cribs registry, there is not a single individual residing in the United States with BBS 16. But there in, in Canada, in the UK, in France, and in Pakistan, there are individuals who participate in Cribs who have that gene. Every one of them has gone to kidney failure required a transplant before 12 years of age. That's really important because not only does it say, hey, this is a high risk gene, but it also says to me, as a kidney doctor, when I have a child that comes to me with that gene, I've got to be preparing today for tomorrow, which means a kidney transplant. And that and many other things have been made possible through your joining and helping me with CRIBS. Um, through that, we developed um, in the United States, when children go to school, they develop, if they have um, cognitive challenges, they, there's a thing called an Individual Education Plan, or IEP. Working with um, a professor and other individuals at Harvard University, we developed an I, a white paper on IEPs that hopefully can be used in, in the BBS uh, community in the UK that is available on our website um, for your use. So those are just some things that came from CRIBS um, that are continue to come from CRIBS. And again, I think sharing data, working together, whether it be with the UK registry or the CRIBS registry or other registries throughout the, throughout the world, we can combine and, and conquer and make great uh, advances in, in research in Barty Beetle syndrome. Now I'd like to share with you as I close some information about research that's been made possible through CRIBS. This, I'll read this statement from a parent um, the statement was made in 2016. Her comment was this, weight is a huge issue. Uh, weight is a huge issue BBS, uh, BBS families deal with. People are automatically so much more drawn to help and give compassion to children with vision loss than they are with obesity. People just think we should control the things our kids eat better and get them out to exercise more. I'm sure there's individuals listening to this presentation today who have been told by their doctor that they just need to get their child out, out exercising more and eating less. These, that happens in the United States all the time. Tragically, these families are, feel, are, feel like they are the uh, problem behind weight loss. Well, uh, a weight gain, I should say. This same child is now in a clinical trial. Her picture is on the, the um, far left for, my, for the way I'm looking at the screen. She um, has started on this drug called setmelanotide. Um, and you can see, um, for those who, uh, who need some explanation, on the top curve is her height. And she's growing very nicely between the, what we call the 75th and 95th percentile. Her weight was greater than the 99th percentile when she started on the therapy. And now her, her weight is below the 75th percentile. Um, it's, it's been a life-changing experience for them. Um, also in this, this um, uh, picture, the, the diagrams of the growth curves for two other individuals, both treated with this drug, which has made a tremendous improvement in their weight gain, or weight loss, I should say. Well, I'm not here to advertise for the company. They can do that for themselves. But I do want to point out that this study was made possible because of CRIBS. What had happened back in 2016, I was approached by the company. They had, they had used the drug in a couple other very, very rare um, conditions. It seemed to be working very well. And they had reason to think that perhaps it'd work in Barty Beetle syndrome. So they approached uh, the, our center and asked if we'd be willing to try um, the study, to try the, the therapy in, in individuals with Barty Beetle syndrome. We agreed to that after we had some chance to look back at the, the, the animal model um, of setmelanotide given to those um, two mice. And uh, in a phase two trial, we recruited eight individuals. And that was important because the company didn't think we could find eight individuals. The, the NIH was able to find two. The NIH is the largest research center in the uh, public finance research center in the United States. They were able to have two children. We had eight. And these aren't just children. We had individuals of all ages you know, ranging in this study from 12 to 62 years of age who were on therapy with this drug. And we found uh, amazing events as people have had a huge change in weight, sense of well-being, and metabolic improvements. Why is that important? It's because we can bring people together through registries 
to make it possible for us to, to, to do drug studies. One of the things that was very important to me was to examine whether this, this drug worked in, in different genotypes of BBS. And we found it, it worked in, in five different genotypes and we'll look at more genotypes as time goes on. It worked in individuals of all ages, all genders and all races. And that was very, very important to me is to make sure that we we're looking at not just individuals who are Caucasians, um, who were healthy individuals that had no other issues going on. We looked at individuals of, of all ethnic groups, of all racial groups, I should say, with um, features that would suggest that they may be a little bit more difficult to lose weight. And Cribs made it possible for us to identify those individuals so we could study them. Well, oops, I'm sorry about that. I just want to point out, as I conclude this, this effort, or this, this presentation today, is that the future really is bright for Barty Beetle syndrome. This is pictures of individuals from the United States. I believe as we team up together with, with the UK, with Europe, with, us, with places from across the world, as this author from Japan said, that we can work together to find answers, to make a difference in the lives of individuals with BBS. I'm thrilled to be able to share with you just a little bit about what we're doing here in the States. Um, I think there's so much more to do and we have what wonderful opportunities to do that together. Thank you so much.